Good morning and welcome to the Shankman Private Client Group Account Attorney Spring Webinar Series. This program is entitled COVID-19 <clears throat> New York Tax Hot Topics. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jonathan Shankman. I'm a financial advisor, portfolio manager, and accredited investment fiduciary at Oppenheimer based in New York City. The goal of all my programs is to bring professionals together <clears throat> to better help them serve their clients. This is done by educating attendees on the latest topics in wealth planning and by encouraging collaboration between a client's attorney, CPA, and financial advisor where appropriate. My practice focuses on working with high net worth families, businesses, and not-for-profits. I manage individual investment portfolios, trust accounts, corporate retirement plans, and endowments to help my clients achieve their financial goals. In addition to the 2025 events I run every year, I also do a fair amount of writing on the topics of investing and financial planning. You can read my work in Barron's, CNBC, Forbes, Kiplinger, The Wall Street Journal, The CPA Journal, Trust and Estates Magazine, and many other periodicals. My latest article is published in Kiplinger and is entitled, Are You Planning to Use Target Date Funds in Retirement? Seven Key Considerations to Keep in Mind. After the program, I'll send out a link to this article and all the publications where I publish my work. Today, we're privileged to hear from Timothy Noonan, who's a partner, a tax residency practice leader at the New York-based law firm Hodgson Russ. Tim focuses his practice in the state and local tax area. His work primarily involves New York State and New York City tax litigation and controversy. Over the past 20 years, he has handled more than 1,500 personal income tax, sales tax, corporate tax, or other New York tax audits. He has handled some of the most high profile residency cases in New York over the past decade, including a 2014 win in the Guyette case, one of the first New York residency cases to ever reach New York's highest court. Tim is the Noonan and Noonan's Notes, a monthly column in Tax Notes State. He's also a nationally recognized author and speaker on state tax issues, having written more than 200 articles, gives around 20 speeches a year around the country. Since I know that 50% of attendees today are from out of state, I wanna point out that Tim has handled a significant number of residency and sales tax issues in other states, including work with many national and international clients on multi-state compliance or voluntary disclosures. And with that introduction, I'll now turn the program over to Tim. Thanks, Jonathan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be back in front of this group. Um, sort of funny, I was thinking this morning, the first, webinar, Zoom webinar I did was with Jonathan like last May or early May. It was like the, you know, the first time we started doing these things um, and we're still here. So um, I, although there's a lot of people signed up today, which is fantastic. Uh, nice work there, Jonathan. And uh, we couldn't fit them all into sort of Jonathan's conference room there um, in the city. And, and he'd have to buy way too many bagels too. So it's it's probably good. It's, it's in this format, but um, and I love this sort of quick hitter, guys. We got a half hour to kind of have me update you on what's going on. Um, and there's a there's a heck of a lot going on. I mean, if I sort of think about my life in the past, um, what's happened over the past year, it's it's amazing. Um, just in terms of particularly from a residency perspective, and mainly New York, but really there's issues in in all other states, um, both on the residency and the non-resident sort of allocation side. It's it's been like nothing I've ever experienced before in terms of honestly the flood of people outside of New York City. I mean, you guys I'm sure have seen it in your practices. You've sure you've seen it in your lives, um, but it's been it's been an incredible uh, incredible time uh, for us, um, and just crazy with the amount of flight outside outside of New York. So I'm gonna ma mainly talk about that and let you know, guys know kind of what's going on um, there. I do wanna first hit the New York budget came out a couple of weeks ago with some important changes. Again, it's it's mildly, mildly on the topic of sort of COVID related issues. Um, so I only wanna spend a minute on it. It might, um, those issues may frankly be worth another, uh, a full, uh, webinar like this. And then I'm gonna get into both kind of the residency side of COVID um, people moving from state to state, and then telecommuting, remote work, um, just give you guys a couple updates as to as to what New York and other states are doing there um, and what's happening. Again, real quick on the budget. So a couple things you guys probably have seen, the sort of highlights, right? These are the main three highlights of, of the budget that got passed a couple of weeks ago. And look, things got a little scary like in February and March because all these different New York senators and assembly people were... Um, throwing different, you know, let's raise this rate, let's raise the estate tax rate. It was getting nutty. Um, it still ended up, you know, sort of, you know, I think uh, 
questionable policy decision. Um, you already had everyone in America leaving New York City, raising tax rates, I think probably not the best idea, but the corporate rate went up a little bit. You see here on the slide. And of course, the, the big news was the income tax rate goes up too. Now it goes up for, you know, joint incomes over 2 million bucks. But nonetheless, um, for the highest earners, uh, New York State is now, not, New York State City uh, combined with New York State is now the highest uh, taxing jurisdiction um, in the country. So yay, New York City, way to go. So that, and look, that happened two weeks ago. And I, I'm not going to lie, the amount of calls I've received in the past two weeks because of this people now saying now it's time to go. So it's it's been it's been a confluence of factors getting people to move, but things like this definitely do not help. The last thing that kind of helps sort of a little, um, and indeed Governor Cuomo said, well, yeah, we're raising rates, but you know, with this SALT workaround, um, the rate really doesn't cost taxpayers as much. So you guys know that um, lots of states to get around the, the cap on the SALT deduction have proposed entity level taxes. They're sort of becoming all the rage um, and really kind of, you know, uh, sped up in like the fall when the IRS came out and basically blessed entity level tax schemes. New York didn't have one, as you guys know, Connecticut has one, New Jersey has put one in place. Um, a bunch of other states are now kind of following suit, including finally New York. Um, and just a couple quick highlights. Honestly, this is a great topic for a full other uh, seminar, um, but you know a couple important points on this um, this this new entity tax. Again, it's a new tax, but it's it really is designed to help taxpayers get the benefit of the salt deduction that they lost. Um, but it's only taxpayers who are uh, owners of pass through entities, so it applies to partnerships, LLCs, and S corporation owners. Um, it really only works well when the owners are residents of New York State. Um, uh, because what happens is the entity pays the tax and then the resident gets a credit for the tax paid on the entity. So look, if my law firm does it and I'm going to be championing that my law firm does indeed do it, I'm not going to pay New York State tax anymore, at least on my partnership income, right? My firm will pay the tax. I'll get a credit off of my New York personal income tax, which by the way, um, in anticipation of my firm electing in, I went a little cheap on my estimated taxes for New York back in April, but that's that's between me and New York State. But in any case, um, that's the idea. The firm pays my tax. The firm can deduct the tax because it's a business. Um, so I basically get the benefit. I, I receive less money from the firm, but I also get taxed less federally um, because uh, because the firm has used my tax as an expense. We're still working through this. It just came out. There's some goofy things. Um, for instance, if if you're an S corporation, the tax on the S corporation is limited to the New York source income of the S corporation, not all of its income. For partnerships, it's all of the income. So that's a little goofy. Um, it's not applicable to uh, sole proprietorships, um, single member LLCs. Those entities should look into maybe restructuring to take advantage of that. Um, it was also been a lot of chatter about, well, would this apply to like an investment partnership or a, a, a hedge fund sort of a carry entity? Um, and there's a question as to whether or not, I mean, certainly those entities could elect into this tax. New York State will be happy to let them elect into. The question will be whether the feds will allow that deduction for an investment partnership type entity. Again, that's more of a federal tax issue. Um, but again, just wanted to issue spot a couple of those things for you guys. Obviously, I'm sure a lot of you are already looking in, into those issues for your client and just watch sort of our propaganda and our blogs because we're, we're doing a, a, a webinar on this in a few weeks. I'll be putting out an article on it uh, fairly soon as well. So keep, keep in touch for that. Just a couple of things that didn't pass. They had proposed getting rid of the, basically the ability to be a hybrid S corporation in New York, basically make all S corporations, federal S corporations, New York S corporations. That didn't pass. They again tried to um, allow the government, the, the New York state tax department to appeal tax tribunal decisions. Right now they can't do that, that didn't pass. That goofy pied -tear tax that they've been talking about um, imposing on second homeowners in New York city, that didn't pass. And thankfully the estate tax didn't go up either. So that's basically the budget. Um, I do wanna sort of turn my focus now to um, sort of the COVID residency piece of things. So look, there were travel restrictions, office closures, 
changes in work arrangements, as you can see, I'm still uh, hanging out in my actually it's kind of cool in my home office I'm, I, I'm 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 very much liking that but it's really it's changed a lot of things it's changed people's directions in their lives where where they're living where they're working it's a, it's really impacted residency remote working and then how the tax tax applies for for that remote working so those are the things we're going to be talking about today so again you all you guys all know sort of the basics of, of new york's residency rules um, residents are taxed on everything non-residents only taxed on income from New York sources. And again, there's two tests. I mean, I this is basically all I talk about every day. The first test is the statutory test. Um, that's very objective. If you spend more than 183 days in New York and you have a place in New York while well, you're a resident, that's easy. The tougher test is the domicile test, more subjective, right? Um, you know, your primary home, um, you have to leave New York and land in the new state. Right, that becomes super important as we're going to see in a couple of examples. Um, this leave and land rule is super critical. Um, ultimately, we're judging someone's domicile. We're balancing five factors mainly, um, the factors listed on our slide here, and seeing which of those factors points to Florida, which is the common destination for a lot of our New Yorkers, um, which points to New York, and we're basically trying to load up the Florida facts as much as we can to build the case to move to Florida or the Hamptons or Connecticut or, or, or wherever the taxpayer is going. But what's happening in COVID? So first, again, everyone seems to be moving, um, particularly out of the city. Um, that seems to be the, the common destination. I've actually changed my voicemail. Hi, it's Tim Noonan. Sorry, Mr. Call. Press one to move to Florida, plus two to move to the Hamptons, plus three to move to Connecticut. It's, you know, it's unbelievable the flood of people thinking about this. And you know, historically for me, most of my practice has been fighting these audits, right? People bring me in when they get the audit letter um, or they bring me in when they get the assessment and we litigate it, right? Or we, we handle the audit. Um, sure, historically, we've also been asked to plan moves, but, but really most, most folks have been doing that with their accountants um, and they come to me basically when there's, there's a problem. More people are coming to us now um, and that's good. We're, we're planning these moves uh, in advance. That's great. We can, you know, again, we've been through the battles on these things. We've been through thousands of these audits. So I yeah, have a good feel for what, what works and what doesn't work, but man, everyone's moving. Um, it really is amazing. Um, I wonder how these states are going to chase everybody. Um, I'm also hearing New Jersey, which has been historically basically asleep at the wheel on these residency cases. I'm starting to look into a residency related program. I've seen a couple of Jersey residency audits. I've seen more New Jersey residency audits in the past couple of months than I've seen in 20 years. So, I mean, it's like five, but still um, it's a lot. So that's one thing. The other thing is it's weird because in 2020 and sometimes maybe in 2021, not a lot of people were actually in the New York City area for more than 183 days. So a lot of people think, oh, sweet. I don't have to pay tax in New York City. Well, as you know, unfortunately that's not the rule, but it does create a lot of confusion as to where taxes should be paid in 2020. I'm sure a lot of you guys are going through that now, getting the 2020 taxes ready. Um, to me though, the biggest issue on all of these moves is the permanency of the move, right? So everyone left New York in March of 2020, right? The question is, okay, fine, we left. Some people even gave up their place, um, but did they land, right? You have to leave and you have to land. And for the most part, the thinking has been, well, look, if you if you leave in March 2020 and you come back in September 2021, um, the audit of your 2020 taxes or your 2021 taxes, for that matter, likely isn't going to occur to like 22 or 23. Right. You don't file your 2020 taxes until October 2021. It's not probably not going to get audited for a year because they're going to be super busy. Um, so, again, we're into 22, 23. The first thing the auditors are going to do is say, well, you know, let me see your day count from March 20 to, to today, right? Let me see if it's stuck. Let me see if you really moved. Because if you didn't, hindsight's going to be 2020. And they're going to say, look, if you came back, your move wasn't permanent. So that's a key factor that comes up in a lot of these situations um, is, again, talking to our clients about what I don't really care that they have a great day count in 2020, right? I want to, I want, I care what their day count looks like in 22, honestly, and in 21 to see if it's stuck. The other interesting procedural thing that's happening here, and some of you guys have, may have seen this, we've had, I'd say maybe 10 clients already, like sort of the super early filers, like the people who've already filed their 
2020 taxes. Most of the time they're wage earners who just want to get their refund, uh, but big, you know, a couple million bucks in wage income. So those folks are getting desk audit letters from New York state right off the bat before the refund is even paid. It's been a form letter. Hey, we're checking into your rent before we process your return. We're checking into your residency status and we're checking into your income allocation. The profile for these inquiries has been someone who changed their residency, obviously, or someone who maybe had a hundred percent income allocation, non-resident um, in, in prior years, but in 2019 reported a 30% work allocation audit letter right away. Now, look, it's not a real audit. It's not the normal, typical field audit where you get someone from Brooklyn or Buffalo or Syracuse, a real person. It's a computer, almost like a computer generated letter. You, you, you send it into the, the vast, you know, uh, system that is New York state. There's no person. I don't know what's going to happen, but I think you all should be prepared um, that when you hit send on that tax return for a lot of these, these, these taxpayers who have had changes like this in 2020 and 20 in 2020, we, we could be seeing a flood of these desk audit letters. So it's going to be nutty. Um, and just, just be ready for that. Um, happy to chat with anyone about what I think that's going to look like. I can show you guys the letter that, that we've seen, um, but definitely be prepared for that. It is, um, and again, that's a development over the past couple of weeks. And then the last sort of overall consideration is look, no one's making any really any special, at least day counting rules. Oh, you were stuck because of a quarantine or you, were, you couldn't come here because of a, you know, the, the 14 day travel rules. Nobody cares. There's, there's no, been no special adjustments based on that. So let me just give you a couple different client profiles that I've seen just so you can get a feel for the kinds of issues we've been dealing with. This is a very typical one here um, uh, on slide 10. So we have taxpayer who lives in the city, works there, lives there with family uh, and his wife, um, but goes to the Hamptons in March of 2020. Uh, kids are Zoom schooling in the fall of 2020, maybe even into, 20, into 2021, um, still Zoom schooling. Um, but look, they're coming back. They, they love their school in the city. Um, you know, they work in the city, got a beautiful apartment, um, but their day count super low in 20, super low in 2021. Again, the issue here, typical issue is this leave and land rule, right? Did they leave New York City? I don't know, maybe they didn't spend a lot of time there, but did they land in the Hamptons with the intention of permanently residing? It's a tougher call to make for these guys, especially if they come back. Look, a lot of my clients, maybe this was their thought process last year at this time, but now a year later, they're like, screw it, we're just gonna stay, right? So they'll take steps to change their residency now. And again, this could be a Hamptons fact pattern or Connecticut or Florida or wherever, right? But you still have to stay, right? You still have to land. If you come back, you could have a tough time proving it. And look, we, a few years ago, our firm won a case where a guy moved to Texas for a year and a half. This was the famous dog case, right? It's the guy who took his dog with him. Um, and he came back a year and a half later. We won. I mean, it took four or five years to litigate that case to, to sort of the end of the earth, but we won um, because he was able to credibly testify that he really moved to Texas. He just life changed and he came back. If you want someone to be able to take that position, they're going to have to sort of intention wise, be able to argue the same thing that they really intended to move and they did move, but the world changed again and they came back. So it'll be a factual issue that could be tough to, to tough to deal with. It's another fact pattern that I've seen a lot. Um, and again, the, the profile of people that I see moving now is so different than what it was four or five years ago when it was the you know uh, older folks, they're retiring or someone's about to sell their business. That was usually the profile. Now I have millennials moving. I got moms and dads with kids moving. And this is, this is one of those situations where mom and dad and kids are moving. Mom uh, uh, runs a hedge fund in the city. It's got management fee income, got carried interest. Um, they get down to Florida, mom gets there first. Dad and the kids come a couple months later. So it's a real move, right? They got rid of their place in the city. They got a place in Florida. They get the kids in school in Florida starting in the fall of 2020. In this example, 2020. It's a legit move, right? Leaving land, all good. Um, but some questions might arise. Well, when do they move? Because did they move in March when they first got down to Florida and they were staying with their family? Eh, probably not. They didn't really decide to move then. Did they move in July when mom moved down there when the rental started? Or it really isn't until September when dad comes down with the kids. I don't know. So those will be battles we can expect to have. The other issue will be, of course, well, how do you do the, 
the residency thing, the part year residency thing. Um, when you have someone who's a part year resident of, of New York State, New York City, generally you're prorating their income between their resident period and their non-resident period. However, if the income is fixed, determinable, guaranteed before the move, um, even if it's throwing through a partnership, then the state can say, no, 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 you, you got you to report that all before you move. In the same way, though, if it's something like carried interest that really doesn't crystallize until December 31st, well, there's likely a good argument for the, this taxpayer here that really it, that doesn't accrue within the partnership until 1231, 2020. So New York State doesn't get any of it. New York City doesn't get any of it. So again, these, these part year resident issues have been things we've been grappling with as well. Um, last situation. Um, Taxpayers in the city goes to Connecticut um, after COVID, got a vacation home up there, is still there. Well, what happened to a lot of these folks, they, they would call us in September of 2020. They're like, yeah, we're still in Connecticut, da, da, da. The problem was in 2020, they had a place in Connecticut for the year and they had more than 183 days in Connecticut for the year. That's residency guys, right? That's, that's the statutory residency issue in Connecticut. Um, so this taxpayer could have a problem, right? They could be a domiciled taxpayer in New York City because they're coming back, right? They don't have a leave in land. They're definitely coming back. But they're in Connecticut, right? Um, over 183 days, they have a place of abode. They're a statutory resident of Connecticut. And as you all probably know, there's double tax in that situation uh, under current law on investment income, on intangible income. So New York City taxes it, state and city tax it because the guy lives there. Connecticut taxes taxes it because the guy is a statutory resident, no resident credit, terrible result. Now, look, I think I've heard um, that Connecticut, um, Connecticut has already taken a, a good approach on the convenience rule issue. I'll talk about that in a second. I've heard that Connecticut might be taking a softer approach on this issue as well, at least for 2020. Um, again, I've some, some heard some specific intel on that. So that's helpful. Um, there may be an argument that the taxpayer really isn't a statutory resident in Connecticut, um, given the sort of temporary nature of their accommodations there. But again, I, I think legally this taxpayer could have an issue, but practically speaking, it might, it might not come up if Connecticut doesn't, doesn't chase after it. All right, so those are some quick hitters on residency. Real quick, um, and again, I see a couple questions coming in, guys, but because it's such a short program, we have um, lots of people on the panel. Um, what I suggest is if you have a, a question, just shoot me an email. My email will be at the end of the slideshow. I'm happy to answer the email later. Um, all right, so remote work. So um, let's, just, let's just do a quick example just to just sort of talk about how this issue works. So here we have someone who lives in Florida, but, you know, I'm sorry, lives in New York, but really did a move, right? COVID hits, gives up New York lease, moves to Florida, real move, leaving land, good stuff. Her employer though is based in the city. The employer doesn't have a Florida office, but like many employers are like, hey, this is working out pretty well. Work, work wherever the hell you want, right? You can work from home in Florida, that's cool. So for this taxpayer, it's good. She's saved New York City taxes, right? She's moved to Florida. Um, her domicile is in, in, in Florida. That's good. New York City tax gets turned off, but she's still getting a lot of compensation you know, from her employer. And under New York's convenience rule, if someone is working from home for their own convenience, the employer still has to withhold New York tax, the employee still has to pay New York tax on her compensation. That's the convenience rule. Historically, six states have had a convenience type rule, New York being sort of the most infamous one because they've been so aggressive on it. And basically, the idea is if the employee is working from home for their convenience, and we'll talk about that in a sec, um, then the days, even though they're working at home, get treated as New York days. And again, the way New York taxes wages is based on how many days you worked in New York. Work at home days in Florida for convenience, those are New York days, even though you're physically present in Florida. Historically, convenience has been defined pretty broadly, that basically it's if the nature of the work is such that you could do it from the office and you just choose to do it at home, then the day gets sourced to New York. If your employer says, go meet with Bill Jones in Florida, fine, that's out of state work. But if the work could be done in New York, conference calls, Zooming, doing emails, and that's what the, the employee is doing in their home office, then that's, 
And New York's rule is that's going to be sourced back to New York. And in the summertime um, of 2020, New York basically doubled down on this, issued some guidance on their website, basically saying like, COVID uh, work, work at home, it's all still subject to the convenience rule. Um, even if, I mean, they didn't specifically say this, it was intimated. Even if the office is closed or restricted, which again, you all know, many of our office arrangements have been, either the office has been closed or, or definitely restricted. New York says, mm, too bad, so sad, still a convenience rule issue. So a pretty aggressive position by New York. Um, so what is, so go back, like what is, what is, what does this taxpayer do, right? Now she's in Florida, love in Florida, but you still got to pay 100% New York tax. That stinks, right? Well, a couple things this taxpayer could do. We've been doing a lot of this type of workaround work for folks. First, her employer could open up an office in Florida, right? If they open up an office down the street and she goes and works in that office and we assign that as her primary office, well, we should be okay. The convenience rule says days worked at home gets sourced to New York. Well, days worked at the Florida office of the company, those aren't work at home days. You're in an office, so that should work. Um, so, you know, the company has to pay for it. It's gotta be used. They can't just open up a fake office and have nobody go there. Um, the, the employee should go there, but that works. What about, well, we don't have an office in Florida, but we do have an office in, in Georgia. So we're gonna sign the, the employee to the office in Georgia. Does that work? Eh, again, the, the idea is, the work at home days get sourced back to the taxpayer's primary office. Well, sure, you can say the George office is the primary office, but if she never goes there and she still ends up going to New York, you know, a few times a quarter, factually speaking, we might get into a fight with New York about really where the primary office is. The third option, this is an interesting one. If you never come to New York, you telecommute all the time. The convenience rule actually doesn't apply. There's case law, it's even in New York's audit guidelines that if you don't come into New York, then it doesn't count. There's no convenience rule. So just don't come back, that works. And then the last way is a, is a little tougher, but New York actually has a safe harbor that if your office in your home is deemed to be a bona fide employer office, it's a sort of a special term that they created, that's a safe harbor, the days count. To get a bona fide employer office, well, it's a little difficult you see on our slide here, basically the taxpayers got to meet four of the six factors on the left there and three out of the 10 factors on the right. But look, what we've been doing is working with employers to basically set up either a telecommuting letter or an agreement or something that tries to tick off all of these factors. You can do it. In fact, in the website guidance the tax department gave last year about COVID and telecommuting, they said that the convenience rule doesn't apply if you can meet the, you know, the, the specific factors here. So it works, it takes some doing, you, it just isn't gonna arise out of thin air. You actually have to think about it and take some steps, but it's a pretty cool way to avoid this issue on a go forward basis. Lastly, just a quick note, guys, this is an issue all across the country um, and states have, the rules are all over the place. Um, a lot of states have followed the convenience rule concept and basically, temporarily adopted a convenience rule like, like New York. A bunch of states have said, forget that. If you're working in our state physically, even if you're working from home, that's work in our state. So you think about it and here, let me just give you this. This is, I have a blog, uh, we're running blog post uh, on, our, on my blog, uh, on our website that you can check out, but we're tracking this in all these states. This is a disaster, look at it. Half the states are saying, source it to where the employer is. The other half are saying, no, source it to where the employee is. It's a disaster, right? So you, you could have a situation where someone's telecommuting from, from Maryland to New York City. New York says it's New York City taxable. Maryland says it's Maryland taxable. And we got double taxation. That's a disastrous result. But because of the different ways states are doing this, you have that problem. Again, the fix, I think, is to go back and fix, fix it if it's a New York issue fix it in New York by taking one of these steps. If you take one of these steps, you fix it in New York, then you're not gonna have double taxation. You might have taxation in the other state if it's Maryland or something like that, but you certainly won't if it's Florida. So there is there, there are ways to go about and fix that. All right, guys, that's a wild trip through COVID related residency issues. If you have questions, feel free to call me or email me. Happy to, to, to answer questions and uh, thanks, Jonathan. Great, thank you so much, Tim. <clears throat> 
Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to Tim or myself where appropriate. And as Tim mentioned, um, his, well, his email is here, and I'm going to leave it in the follow-up email to this program as well. A few people asked for slides. Um, the slides were sent out as part of the reminder email. They'll be sent out again as part of the follow-up email. So just click on the link, and you'll have all the slides there. Um, as mentioned at the onset, the goal of these programs is to stay up to date on timely wealth management topics and to collaborate where appropriate. I think we can all agree that the clients who are best prepared are the ones who are served by a team of knowledgeable advisors. Two more quick items before I let you go. First, my next program will be on May 13th and is entitled U.S. Estate and Gift Planning for Foreign Parents with U.S. Children, featuring Stanley Ruckelman and Galia Antebi from New York-based law firm Ruckelman PLLC. You receive an invitation to this webinar and all of my upcoming sessions in the coming days, and I hope you can attend. Second, be sure to take 30 seconds to fill out my survey at the end of this program. It helps me improve my webinars and provide timely and interesting content to attendees. Uh, I thank you for that in advance. And with that, this concludes today's session. Please stay safe and healthy. Have a wonderful day, everybody.